Hello, I'm Jessie and welcome to Tech World, your quick roundup of some of the top technology stories from the past month. In this episode, we bring you the latest on Bitcoin's price movements, Airbnb's political drama and more. For this month's Hot Topics interview, we spoke to EY's Natalie Langley about tax advice for startups. First though, here are your top international headlines. It's been a while since we last told you about Bitcoin, and we can report that the cryptocurrency's value has suffered a significant blow. Bitcoin's price fell well below the $5,000 mark for the first time since October 2017, meaning the total value of all Bitcoin in existence dropped to below $87 billion. The news comes after Bitcoin Cash, an offshoot of Bitcoin, split into two different cryptocurrencies, which are now in competition with each other earlier this month. Some commentators have blamed this for creating turmoil in the crypto market, with many of the digital assets experiencing falls. Facebook-owned photo sharing platform Instagram is launching a new scheme that will see it target fake likes and comments. Launched in 2010, the company claims it's developed tools that can identify accounts using third-party services and apps to boost their popularity. Any profiles found to be doing this will be warned and asked to change their password. Last but not least, sharing economy giant Airbnb will remove from its listing all the homes based in Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank. The company said it had come to the decision because settlements were at the core of the dispute between Israelis and Palestinians. Airbnb's decision has been welcomed by Palestinians, but Israel has described it as shameful and threatened legal action. That's all for this month's top tech headlines, but keep watching to see this month's Hot Topics interview. We spoke with EY's Natalie Langley about tax advice for startups. Hi Natalie, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so we're here to talk about tax advice for startups and given the fact that technology, as we know, is a global industry, what tech related things do tech entrepreneurs need to know? So this is, this is one of the crucial areas I find for startup and scale up businesses because as you've quite rightly identified the way the world is at the moment, businesses can be global from day one. It's not mm -hmm. like in the old days where you would establish in a home market and then look to expand overseas. So when I'm talking to startup businesses, um, I often get them to start to think about their journey via their customer base and then how they support their customers and what that means for the structure of the business and where employees are based. So thinking about it from a tax perspective, um, if you look to your first customer or second customer um, and they're based overseas, the kind of things that tech businesses need to think about are what is the service or good or offering that I'm providing to that customer? How am I going about providing it? Is it remote and cloud-based? Or do I actually need people on the ground that are going to be servicing that particular business? Um, and then how am I going to be paid for it? And what's the nature of the money that's, that's coming back to me? And the reason those things are really important is that from a tax perspective, where you've got cross-border transactions between companies and their customers, mm -hmm. They need to be aware of things like withholding taxes, which means that where overseas customers are paying for software or a license or something of that nature, there may be a local requirement to withhold taxes before the payment's made. And for startup businesses, that can often be quite damaging if they're expecting to get 100% of the sales revenue and then they suddenly find they've only got 80% in the bank account. So that's the first piece. The second piece is, is then around, there's a, a bit of a spiral I find with businesses that after they get that first global contract, they then find that they need to get more and more embedded into that particular jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So that question around how you service those, those companies is really important. Because if you need people on the ground over there, you very, very nearly, very quickly need to think about things like immigration, whether you're going to be hiring people locally, whether you're going to be taking on a third party in that particular jurisdiction to help support the contract, um, and how you're going to manage that from your tax reporting and compliance perspective. So one thing that can trip up startup companies a lot is that even if someone is a UK employee, so an employee with a UK employment contract, mm -hmm. if they're physically performing services overseas, then there's a good chance that you're into local jurisdiction rules around payroll taxes, social security, and it's your company's obligation to deal with that in that foreign territory. So that's really important. From there, again, the spiral tends to develop that companies then say, well, we think we need a local presence in that jurisdiction. And so the questions that you then need to ask yourself are, what's the type of entity that I can use over there? How can I get it set up? 
how does that then interact with the rest of my structure? So for example, where is my intellectual property based and how is that company overseas servicing the customer with my intellectual property? And that's where we get into the exciting world of transfer pricing and things like that, which I think is a really good opportunity for companies to take a step back and, and look at their, their global issues and work out really the basics of who do I have in the business, where are they based, and what function are they performing? And it doesn't need to be you know, more complicated than that, but it gives businesses a really good basis for, for thinking about how they're gonna manage their, their global reporting requirements due to having that, um, that international aspect very early on. For the other businesses, there can be specific issues. So um, when I'm talking to e-commerce businesses, mm -hmm. for example, and we look at the global aspect, supply chain is really, really important. And indirect taxes and VAT and customs can be really quite complicated for some of those businesses. And so one of the things I would recommend is to get clear very early on on what the, the physical route of your supply chain looks like, but also the contractual route of your supply chain. So which entities are dealing with customers, which entities are buying in stock. Um, and once you've got a, a handle on that, you can then begin to, to build out the, the technical analysis of how you deal with it. So where a lot of companies will trip up is UK companies who are selling goods overseas mm -hmm. won't necessarily realise that they may have obligations to register for VAT in other jurisdictions and apply local rates of VAT rather than UK rates of VAT. This has also been uh, slightly complicated by changes to US tax law that's coming through at the moment. So US sales tax is going through a bit of an evolution at the moment and it means that businesses in the UK that are selling goods and services into the US may now have more reporting obligations under UK US sales tax rules than they had previously. So that can be quite challenging to manage for, for businesses that are perhaps still in very early startup phase. So you've touched on some of the issues already, but what other challenges are tech entrepreneurs coming up against when it comes to tax and regulation? I think every time I, I talk to entrepreneurs and, and when you know, we meet at events, and I always ask that question because it's always nice to know what's on the mind of entrepreneurs. And in some ways it doesn't change. One of the key issues that still comes up time and time again is attracting the right employees to the business and making sure that they can be rewarded in such a way that is appropriate to keep them there and incentivise them. So in some senses that's a, a wider issue than just tax because you want to make sure that the people you're bringing in are the right cultural fit and businesses, or particularly entrepreneurial businesses, need to make sure that when they're bringing those people in, which can often be very fast and, and very quick, that they're doing it in such a way that they are um, in, able to explain the vision of the business and really embed those people in the culture. And that way, you know, hopefully it's a virtuous cycle that they can then, then attract more people who can help to grow the business. But from a tax angle, we still see a lot of businesses using share incentivisation um, to attract the right kind of employees and in some ways it's, it's an expectation out there in tech businesses now that the employees that are coming on will get share options in the business. Um, and so it's important for companies to think about that early on, make sure that they're implementing the right kind of reward strategies, but also communicating it properly to the employees. So, for example, the Enterprise Management Incentive Share Plan is a great tax efficient way for businesses that don't have a lot of money to reward their, their employees with share options. But I really encourage businesses to explain it better to their employees and talk to them about what it means to them and why they're receiving it. And that way you can kind of better align the objectives of the employee that's coming in with the objectives of the business rather than it just being a bit of a transaction in terms of giving, giving people options. So I think globalisation, as we talked about before, is, is the other major challenge and, and how you manage that. And businesses, entrepreneurial businesses, need to move very fast. Um, and need to be agile. We often hear the word agile in these types of businesses. So we appreciate the need to get out there and you know explore those new markets and take people on very quickly. But as an accountant, I often encourage the businesses you know to, to take a step back and look at what they're doing and also try not try not to operate in silos. So you may have the commercial team going out and signing up customers and perhaps even forming new entities in other jurisdictions without the finance team necessarily being able to step in at the right time. So the more businesses can look holistically at what the commercial strategy means for the tax and legal structure, the earlier on that they can do that, the less likely they are to either get themselves into difficulties in other jurisdictions or have to go back and revisit things and, and move things around.
Yeah, because ultimately um, tech founders and entrepreneurs need to ensure that their businesses are running smoothly at home before they embark on trying to um, launch in a new territory. And that's hugely challenging and, and entrepreneurs have often said to me, again going back to the culture point, that not only do you have to keep control of that, that business at home, but quite often in order to, when you're looking at an expansion into say the US, because you have quite a large geographical distance, you may need senior members of that management team to move abroad for a period of time. And that can be immensely challenging for a business and, and often you see it working quite well where you have co-founders and they can you know, split the responsibilities for, for that kind of thing. Again, to bring it back to tax, if you've got people moving over to the US um, for a long period, you absolutely need to think about immigration and the tax consequences of it because I quite often see you know conversations where they're saying well the CEOs spent three months in the US this year just going back and forth and you kind of go okay <laughs> let's take a step back and figure out what that means then for for his own or her own personal tax situation and, and the obligations of the business um, but also in that you, you raise an absolutely valid, valid point because there are so many other bits and pieces that can cause businesses to take their eye off the ball a little bit. And the other one that always comes up is fundraising. So when companies are going through a big fundraising round, um, often it's a huge time commitment for the senior members of the management team um, and other people in the business who are pulling together the projections and the business plans and things like that. And so I guess one piece of advice there is that if you are going into a fundraising round, you need to go in with your eyes open and not think that this is something that can be done as a kind of you know few hours in the evening as a, yeah. an add-on to the day job. Yeah. Because every entrepreneur I've talked to has always said that took a lot more time and effort than I expected it to. So it's worth bearing that in mind when you're planning on the ongoing running of the business. So we recently had the budget announcement here in the UK. Are there any changes that tech entrepreneurs need to be aware of? So there's, there's a couple of interesting things that came out of the budget. The first one is, is a bit of a, a bigger picture and indicates direction of travel for taxation of digital companies. Okay. Um, and that's the, the consultation, the introduction around the, the digital services tax. Mm -hmm. um, this is it's, I think this is going to be something that, that goes on and on for the next few years because we've seen different proposals from the OECD, from the EU and from HMRC and HMRC um, and government are now taking the initiative to introduce a, a you know, UK specific one okay. but at the moment it's the, the way it's, it's written is it's going to affect the larger businesses but I think it is really important for startups and scale-ups to be aware of it mm. because at the moment we're still dealing with tax legislation that was written many years ago in an entirely different world sure. and things do need to change because the way businesses are run these days is entirely different to when those rules were first put in place. So that's one to watch out for and I yeah. think that's going to change over the coming years. The two specific changes that, that may affect startups were around entrepreneurs relief. So for entrepreneurs relief there's been changes to the definition of personal companies on who qualifies for, um, for entrepreneurs relief on a sale of the business. So that's something for entrepreneurs to think about when they're looking at both transactions that might dilute their shareholding or if they've got a potential exit coming up anytime soon. And the other one is a, a, again a consultation um, with the view that in 2020 the rules on R&D tax credits are going to change slightly. And again, it's, it's, it's a small change, but it will be interesting to see how many businesses it, it, it affects in practice. Because what's going to happen is that the repayable R&D tax credit, which, as we know, so many of our entrepreneurial businesses rely on, is going to be capped, or it's proposed that it's going to be capped, at three times the PAYE and national insurance bill of the particular company. So where I can see potential, um, a bit of thinking behind that, is for businesses where they have a lot of um, outsourced R&D. Mm -hmm. So where they're taking, where they have people who are not necessarily employees of the company, but they've outsourced R&D development and they may have a very you know, skeleton crew of people actually employed by the business mm -hmm. and therefore a lower PAYE bill. So in situations like that, as I say, not, not coming in until 2020, yeah but something to keep an eye on and certainly something that I'm talking to the companies that I know a lot about at the moment. Last but not least, what advice would you give to tech entrepreneurs when it comes to tax and company structuring? So I think um, it's really important to talk to people. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing because the, the businesses that I work with get so much great advice and support from their peer group, first of all, um, around you know, businesses that are maybe six, 12 months further down the line mm -hmm. who have encountered these challenges and, and may have advice on how they can manage them themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
when it comes to the structure and particularly around international stuff, um, I would say just, just think about it, keep it, front of mind always needs to be the commercial aspect of the business, but whenever you're looking at new territories, think about what it means to your structure, think about where employees are based. As tax people, we, we still get really concentrated on where people are physically performing duties, mm -hmm. which is sometimes a bit of, bit weird to explain to tech businesses because everything can be done remotely these sure. days. And so it's difficult that we sometimes feel that we're laboring the point with them, but it quite often drives the tax consequences of what's going on. So track your employees, work out where they're spending their time, think about what services that they're providing um, to your customers while they're doing it. And then come and, come and talk to your peer groups, talk to um, other people in the profession because we're, we're always happy to, to sit down and, and just think about what it means for your business um, and give it a little bit of the benefit of, uh, of what we've seen with other companies. So yeah, just talk, 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 keep talking and um, I'm sure you get to the right place. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. That's all for now. For more tech-related headlines, head over to www.uktech.news.